follow them now. Okay, so that's a quick overview. So I'm just gonna talk about bids. Um, so Elizabeth uh, covered a little bit of bids, so I'll, I'll try to refresh that and also expand a bit on that. Uh, I'm gonna discuss the, uh, how do you get data into bids, how you validate it. Um, and then I'm gonna spend a fair bit of time focusing on this uh, tool called PyBids. Um, for interacting with uh, your bids data and then how that enables uh, things such as bids, appli bids applications or bids apps that make it easy to uh, work with data, and derivatives, which are the production. And then I'm going to spend the final section talking about two projects uh, that I've worked on, um, at least I've worked on Fitlens and then Neuroscout heavily, uh, depends on Fitlens. Okay, so let's just go ahead and get going. Um, I need to move you all. There we go. Okay. So, uh, yeah. So, bids is the brain imaging data structure. And as I sort of alluded to, and I think Elizabeth said, uh, this is really built on how people currently or previously organize their own data. So, instead of a standard where we figure out the best way to organize all the data and how to categorize it and you know, define all possible metadata, we look at what are people actually doing in their labs. And how do we make a standard that is close to that, that so that everybody's going to be willing to use it, but then that allows us to share data and uh, make better tooling. And so one of the things that we have to do is we build on existing standards. So the Nifty format is basically all tools handle, uh, all neuroimaging tools handle uh, Nifty formats well. And then we use uh, simple text-based formats such as JSON and TSV for tabular and um, key value uh, pair metadata. And so the goal is, here is uh, for it not only to be human legible, but also machine legible. Um, and we'll, we'll see more about that later. One of the advantages of, uh, of machine legibility is now we can actually write a tool that tells you whether or not you have a valid bid data set. And so there's a bids validator and I'll talk about that more later. Uh, specification is a searchable HTML document uh, that you can link to. Um, and we now also distribute a PDF uh, for uh, people who that works better for. Um, so bids is basically a metadata standard. Uh, so it's just how, what is the best way to encode metadata to make it useful for uh, for a researcher. Um, so the, a lot of the metadata is right in the file names, so, and the directory structure. Uh, so subject, session, session imaging modality, um, uh, those, are all, those are all part of the file names and the directory names. And then otherwise, we just generally have enough information to assign unique names to all the types of files that people generally work with. Uh, for more detailed information, or metadata, so there's some stuff that's put in the nifty headers, but uh, bids chose to move pretty heavily towards these uh, JSON sidecar files uh, that are more easily managed with, uh, with just a text editor. So if you need to go in and fix something, it's something that you can do by hand without having special tooling. Uh, there are some various uh, data set level uh, metadata files in addition to all these subject level ones. So data set description is metadata about the data, the entire data set, participants, sessions, scans, TSV, allow you to put in uh, other, other useful uh, attributes. Okay, so how do you get your data into bids? So very often what you end up is, uh, you end up getting from the scanner is a bunch of DICOMs that look something like this with pretty inscrutable names and worse, those names change pretty much for every scanning uh, site is going to have a different convention that they use. And so converting from that can be a bit uh, tedious uh, at best. And so there are, very, there are a lot of converters uh, out there that, because a lot of people wrote them and then started sharing them in, with us. And so now we have a list of them. Um, and al almost all of them build on, at least from coming from DICOM, build on uh, DCM to NIAX, which is an excellent tool uh, that extracts the metadata from DICOMs and will put it in bids format. So it knows a lot about that. 
And then you have, two, as two examples, you have the heuristic DICOM converter or Hubiconv and Bidsify that have different ways of letting you specify a mapping from your institution's uh, conventions into bids. And one thing I want to sort of suggest to people is if you're not scanning yet, I would highly recommend talking to your, um, your MRI techs about the repro in project, which is a set of naming conventions that they can set on the scanner so that they give you out a bunch of DICOMs uh, that can be converted with a single command. You don't need to program anything yourself at all, if assuming your, um, your center adopts these standards. Okay, so you have yourself a bids data set. Oh, and let me um, point out this. Up in the top right, when I uh, talk about a tool, uh, I, may have a, uh, I may have a little command for how to get that onto your computer if you don't already have it, uh, rather than take up space in the middle of the screen. So that's just gonna be there. I'm not really gonna mention it much in the future, but when that changes, you'll know uh, we're dealing with a different tool. Okay, so the bids validator is both a website and a command line tool written in JavaScript that allows you to check whether or not your data set is valid uh, without, without having to upload it anywhere. So there are no privacy issues with, uh, with doing this. So if you install it locally, obviously it's not sending it anywhere. Uh, and it, can, it gives you both warnings and errors. Any places that your data set is not conforming with bids or could have more information that would make your data set more useful. It will, so errors mean it's not conforming. Warnings mean you could be more conformant. Um, I don't think um, Elizabeth showed uh, an actual, I'm not actually sure that on the laptop that I'm presenting on uh, that I have a, a, a data set to, uh, to validate. But if you go, to, go here and you, uh, try uploading the uh, data set that uh, Elizabeth sent around, then you'll you'll be able to see the what the output of the validator and it'll tell you there's a few warnings and there's actually a couple errors because the validator has gotten a little bit more strict since that data set was published. So what I want to spend most of this uh, next bit talking about is this uh, tool PyBids. So if you're if you're uh, working in Python, this is an incredibly useful tool. Uh, for just exploring and working with uh, your data. And this really exploits the fact that now that your data is in this common format, uh, you can query it flexibly through in a programmatic, uh, in a programmatic fashion. And so just to walk through this example, uh, the bids layout, uh, the bids layout object is, is a, uh, one that you pass into, you give it just the root of your data set, and now you can query it with thing or with uh, get queries. And so, say I want a bold file, so I might pick a, uh, I might pick a subject, uh, pixar 002 which I think this should be in the data set that you were uh, sent. I would say I want the suffix bold and the extension nifty.gz. Um, and so, what that shows you is, oh. I need to scroll this slightly differently. How do I do that? There we go, okay. So these, these uh, entities, so the subject shows up in the file name, the suffix is this uh, last part where the modality is encoded, and the nifty gz is the extension. Uh, I'm seeing that's probably chats. Do I need to pause and take questions? I don't, uh, I think maybe just something you could answer out loud, Chris, is what is NPM versus PIP? Oh, so NPM is the Node Package Manager. And uh, so Node.js is a, is a pack, no, it's a, it's a version of uh, JavaScript that can run locally. It doesn't have to run in a browser. So it's, it's a job that makes JavaScript a kind of useful way to write something that can be both distributed as a website and as a separate tool that you can use uh, as a command line tool. And then pip is a installing or installation program for uh, installing packages in Python. Okay. Um, okay. So 
this now this uh so this bids image file is a just a, a wrapper that uh, PyBids has that contains some information or gives you some methods for dealing with the de uh, the file. So this was a list. I found exactly one file that matched these uh, that matched these constraints, and I wrote it in order to do that. So I can also look at the metadata available, and so that so I have to take the first first uh, file out of that list and say get metadata, and for bold series, one of the required bits of metadata is repetition time. Um, and so I find that this has a TR of two seconds. Other things I can find quickly off of the file are uh, entities. So all of these are pieces of the file name. So the data type is here, the func in the, in the file name, the extension subject and suffix were I all specified. And then we also see that the task is Pixar. So I'm assuming that this is a task where they watched a Pixar movie, uh, but I didn't actually look closely at this data set. Uh, are there any other questions that I should cover before moving on? No, okay. Okay, so as I in indicated, uh, Git also allows you to, it returns a list, so it'll return all matching files. So if I only specify the subject, I will get two image files and two JSON files. And so if we look at them here, I get a T, T1 weighted image, T1 weighted JSON, uh, bold JSON and bold image. Um, so if I want to write a query that, uh, sorry, scrolling is extremely hard on Mac. Um, so if I want to, if I want to write a query, I can do do interesting things with it. So, for instance, I might say I want to work find all of the bold uh, the all of the bold series in my data set, and to do that, I need the bold suffix, and I also need to say it's a nifty, it's not a JSON file. And so, as an example, this is something that I have in one of my own uh, in my own data sets for setting fixing it up. Is when I got the nifties from the scanner they actually came encoded with the wrong TR. And so because bids requires your TR inside your nifty to match the TR in your in your nifty header, what I wrote was a script to go through, open up the, all of the files and reset the repetition time to make to make it a valid bids data set. So uh, this bold series is one of the bids image files that comes back. And we have a git image method that returns a nibabel image object. And so from there, we can pull out the zooms. Zooms is the nibabel term for uh, however big a voxel is in any dimension. So for the first three dimensions, which are spatial, it's the voxel size in millimeters usually. And the fourth dimension, it's how long it took to acquire. So it's the repetition time. So the fourth zoom, um, and this is zero indexed, so, uh, I will just replace with uh, the repetition time metadata from the from the image file, and then I will set the reset the zooms in the header, and I will just save the file. So this is just to give you an idea that with not with not a whole lot of uh, code, you can do something pretty useful um, using these queries. Okay, um, so. Yeah, in addition to file queries, we can we also have entity queries. Uh, entities are, uh, again, these things such as subjects, tasks. And so I can just say, what are all the subjects in my data set? And it will just list them out. So I think yours only goes to uh, 15. But if you uh, download the whole data set off of Open Neuro, there are actually 155 subjects. Uh, so from zero or from one to 155. And I can also say what tasks are, were performed what, and what suffices, suffices, I think, is actually how it's supposed to be, but uh, PyBids pluralizes it as suffixes. Um, and we can also constrain it, similar to normal Git uh, query. We can say, I want any subject. And what that means is I don't want any data set level files. I want ones that have some kind of subject attached. And so that's what these query uh, parameters are for. There's also a query none, so I could find all of the suffixes for files that aren't attached to any subject. Um, then in order to find out what all these, uh, 
these queries are available. You can also just ask get entities and it'll tell you you've got subject, session, task, acquisition, contrast enhancing agent, and a whole big list that I'm not going to really go through. Um, and so that's entities. Uh, so we also, BIDS also stores metadata as these JSON files. And one of an important notion in BIDS is the inheritance principle. And that reads that any metadata file might, may be defined at any directory level. The values from the top level are inherited by all lower levels unless they are overridden by a file at the lower level. And so what that means is we can have at the root of the directory, task pixar bold.json. And that includes these things that are common across all of the different bold series for this task. So this is the echo time, this is the repetition time. But at, within each uh, subject, we can have a more specific one. And if there's anything in here that uh, has the same uh, key as in here, the more specific one overrides the, the data set level uh, piece of metadata. And so how that works in PyBids is that's done for you. When you get the metadata from a bold file, um, so again, we'll lay out get We'll choose subject Pixar01 this time. We'll use suffix bold. And here I'm using a list of extensions. So suppose I'm going to look at a data set that I've never seen before. I might not know whether the files are compressed or not. So I can say, get me all the nifties and the nifty GZs. I don't really care. Um, and so take zero there. And then once I've taken the, zero, it is just to get the first, um, get the first bold file. And so when, then when I get the metadata, I can look at what keys are available in the metadata and echo time, which you'll remember was in the uh, root level metadata and the flip angle, which was in the uh, file level metadata or the subject specific metadata are both available in a single dictionary. And we can, uh, we can just query those like a normal dictionary. Um, one thing to note with uh, bids is that metadata is often optional and only a few things are really, really required. So one thing that's defined, for instance, is slice encoding direction, but it's not defined in this data set. So if you, if you do that, PyBids will tell you what you tried to look for um, and what file it's not defined for. So that, especially when you're a couple layers removed in your programming, this can be a useful uh, diagnostic. Um, so just like with the entities, you get these free um, get uh, get functions. So I can I remember flip angle was defined, so I can say get all me all the flip angles that occur within this data set, and I can constrain these again. So uh, I see this flip angle seven, which looks kind of funny. Maybe it's a different uh, it has a different data type from our or from my uh, from the other ones. And so I look and sure enough, flip angle of seven degrees is for T1 weighted images, flip angle of 88 was for a bold image. I can also say, give me all the flip angles for bold images and all these ones in the 80 to 90 range uh, are there. And then I can, if I'm wondering how frequent are these different things, how much variation is there in my data, I can also construct, uh, I can construct a little bit more of a complex query so what I'm looking for here is again, this uh, get flip angle for suffix bold. It's just this, uh, this up here. So I'm gonna loop over those and then I'm going to find all of the files. So just lay out that get flip angle. Oh, uh, so find all the files for which that's uh, the flip angle is that. And I just wanna get the length of that uh, list. And so I find that only one subject had uh, flip angle of 40, 84 degrees, same with 88, 89, but almost all, but all of the rest had a flip angle of uh, 90. And I can even go and look at what subject even. So this, Chris, just can to give I, you an idea of what kind of flexibility you can I there. Can I just ask yeah. you a quick question right, right away? Um, I think most of the students I've seen, uh, we've uh, covered a bit like the list comprehension. I mean, it would be great just uh, for the learning experience in Python to just, uh, if you unwrap a bit what this uh, line is doing. Uh, oh, sure. Yeah, uh, sorry about this. Uh, this this is a fairly common um, Python idiom, um, which is so just like you can have a list comprehension, you can have a dictionary comprehension. So, but instead of a single 
element that you're so you, if I did FA for FA and layout uh, and use list brackets here, I would get just this list again. But I can I can take this and make a mapping of it. So uh, I have one value on the left, which it becomes the key, and another value on the right, which becomes the value. And so this produces a dictionary uh, without having to uh, without having to create a dictionary and then update it, it update it one by one over a normal for loop. Thank you. It's a very powerful uh, uh, construct. Yeah, Python has some very nice uh, syntactic sugar. Okay. Um, so actually, I should. I want to see if there are any questions before I uh, go on to the next part. Was there? I can't actually see. Okay. Well. There was one question, um, and I pointed someone to something, but maybe you have another answer, Chris, about uh, mink in bids. Yeah, it, mink is not in bids. Um, and yeah, I, I don't have a good, uh, I don't have a good reference to give people. I've had various conversations with people, and it would probably be a bit long to go into it right now. Um, but yeah, so Mink is a just another standard kind of like Nifty, and a lot of the metadata that is currently in bids could be put directly in the Mink file. And there are various technical reasons that Mink has that are very appealing, but it is it's at a cost of complexity that many people haven't adopted, and Nifty has extremely high adoption, which is why it ended up in bids. Okay, so. We've seen our uh, sorry, data. sorry, Chris. I'm interrupting you again. I'm, I'm just going to put a quick poll for people whether they are, uh, they have been able to download the data set and uh, install PyBeads. Just make sure that you know they uh, they can follow uh, a little bit. Uh, so the poll is on the uh, is on the Slack uh, the general channel. So if you if you if we can make uh, just like uh, take uh, 20, 15 seconds, we will have a very quick uh, very quick poll. So that. Uh, we're making sure that people are on board and uh, are following. So please uh, take uh, five seconds to uh, uh, to answer that quick poll. It's just like you know to make sure that we are we're not uh, we're good. Yeah, it sounds like uh, you know uh, at least the early responders have uh, <laughs> have been able to download the data set and uh, uh, and there are a bit of a not yet and a couple of issues. Okay, I think, uh, thank you for responding on that. Just uh, making sure that, uh, uh, so we can, if you, if you haven't yet done yet it, done, uh, done it yet, please uh, maybe take those uh, 15 seconds so that you can uh, do it. And I, I think we'll make a, a Chris talk a small uh, uh, you know, down tour for you. Okay. Um, a couple of seconds. Uh, so, as JB says that, I'm actually going to move to a different data set uh, because oh, I'm <laughs> in the case of uh, in the case of uh, DS228, there is not a lot of tabular data to look at. So I've I decided to look at the Midnight Scan Club data, which is DS224. And okay. up here, if you have Datalad installed, this is a quick way to access um, access that data. So Datalad right. alone. We haven't we haven't covered that uh, so far, the, Chris. So uh, so okay. probably, uh, but but you know, just know that you know you will be able to play with those this other data set as you uh, could. Uh, like you can still play with the uh, download the data set, but uh, Chris will be taking another data set for a more full experience. Uh, yeah, and you can do the same things on this data set. You're just going to get much less interesting answers. Right. Um, Thank you all, so, and, uh, and uh, yeah, let you all, uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's resume. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so similar to our, so we've looked at our metadata and we've looked at our image files and we're able to interact with those. Uh, there's also these TSV files that we've had and these, these have just a different um, interface, uh, but we'll see how it's out. Um, so like the image files, you can directly access the contents and uh, the, the way that you'll often look at uh, image files in, in Python is with an iBabel image. The way you'll often look at tabular data in Python is with, uh, with a library called pandas. 
And so they have data frames. So if anybody's used R, that's probably going to be the most, but uh, the, let's see how that works. So if we want to get the participants.tsv file, we can say layout.get uh, part suffix participants extension tsv. And we can see this is a bids data file. And it's uh, sitting here at the root of the directory. And if we do git df for git data frame, this is just directly the contents of this file. So participant ID, gender, age, education degree, education years. The, if you open this up in, the, uh, in a text, uh, text editor, it's going to look very, very similar. But there's, uh, PyBids also has another approach for dealing with tabular data, which is called the collections. Uh, and this, this tries to aggregate the tabular data along with the metadata in a, cons a consistent and coherent frame. Um, so when you do this, you'll, you can say uh, layout get collections at a given level. I'll show you the various levels. So we're going to start at the data set level because this is where we're going to find uh, the participants.tsv information. And what that returns again is a list because there can be multiple collections at a given level. And it gives you these bids variable collection objects. These are not that interesting from the, from the perspective that I want to go through here, uh, but they are useful if you need to manipulate the data before pulling them out as, uh, you, you can modify your tables before generating the table. So for instance, if you have a, um, if you have a cognitive event and you need a, um, you want to convolve it with the hemodynamic response function, you would do it in this variable collection uh, object. And so this is useful for uh, estimating statistical models. But we can always, at any point, just fetch out the data frame. And so that's how I'm gonna look at it for the rest of this. So if we do, if we take our data set level collections and convert it to a data frame, it's gonna look a lot like the participants.tsv, but we have a couple differences. First, we have the suffix of the file. So the metadata associated, the metadata and entities associated with the file are still available. Um, and sub, subject has replaced participant ID. So the participant IDs were uh, sub MSC01, and now it's subject, or it's now subject MSC01. And this is to try to um, bids, bids has a couple ways of naming things that uses participant in some places, subject in other places, and PyBids in order to uh, avoid having just proliferating object I, concepts that really all mean the same thing, has just had to settle on some things. So subject and uh, just directly encoding the label rather than the sub dash label uh, is how uh, we've decided to handle things. We can also look at the subject level, and this tells this uh, gives us a summary of the sessions per subject. Uh, so, in particular, the main thing that MSC has uh, has encoded here is the acquisition time. And I want to note that any time before 1920 is considered anonymized. These are not real dates, obviously. Nobody's collecting fMRI data in 1894, but all of these times relative to one another are they're all offset by the same amount from the actual time um, that the study was performed. And so you, if you want to get a sense of how, how far apart uh, data sets or a certain ses session was collected, um, so maybe, maybe that's of interest when trying to do a statistical analysis uh, to quantify how, why is this session different from that session? Oh, it happened far enough away. That might be interesting information. Um, then the session level, now it shows you each individual scan. Again, the scan acquisition times are, uh, are here. But note here that we have 30 columns, which means each of these bold files, or, so each of these rows corresponds to a bold file, and it has a column for each of the uh, pieces of metadata that apply to each bold file. So this will have repetition time, echo time, flip angle, and all of the usual uh, metadata that we saw earlier. And so we, this, so instead of just pulling out the metadata that's in um, this session.t, scans.tsv, 
you have it pre-collated with potentially interesting metadata wherever it happens to be encoded in the data set. And then the run level is interesting of them because this collects from a variety of sources. So events.tsv is where you encode, uh, you know, I asked the subject at this time to tap their finger for this many seconds. Uh, and then you, if you have any physiological recordings, uh, cardiac, respiratory, uh, thing, and I think those are the main ones. Um, or if you have any stimulus information, so say you played, played them a WAV file and uh, you could have that in there. Uh, and if you have regressors calculated by some other, um, some other tool, so for instance, head motion, uh, you can, those will get loaded in. And so now you have all of these variables uh, collected and associated with each. Um, uh, and, and then you can use this to do things like create design matrices, uh, which I'll talk about a little bit more later. Um, so I'm going to move from querying to generating data. So this might be a good time for a quick question if there is one before I move on. There are a couple of comments, questions. I think Elizabeth, you've been answering most of them, but uh, let me see. Um, yeah. It was a, it was a Mink question. Yes, you can go from Mink to Nifty and Nifty to Mink, but uh, be careful with the right-left uh, uh, orientation uh, and also all the metadata in general. Um, yeah. And NPM. Yeah. We, sorry, I, I was, I put these uh, installation suggestions uh, here. Not necessarily that you need to follow along right now, but if you're going through this later, that the, these will help you recreate what I'm doing. Um, I, I apologize if that's been distracting. Okay, um, so I'll go on to generating data. So this is just to demonstrate that PyBids isn't just for querying. Uh, it, you can take your entities that you parse from file names or you can go, turn around and say, I, I know these things about the file I want to write. What kind of, or can you generate me a path inside the data set? So here you'll notice I'm back to DS228. Suppose I wanted to, um, suppose there was a resting task, which there isn't. Um, and I wanted to say, I wanted to add the instructions parameter because this isn't gonna be encoded in your DICOM, uh, but it is something that is useful to have, uh, it's recommended to have by bids. Uh, so maybe you, all you told your subjects when they went into the resting state is just to relax. And so you create this, uh, you can create the file name with build path, and then you, and so then you can manipulate it yourself, or you can use a method called uh, write contents to file. Again, you pass it the entities, uh, but then you can uh, also give it contents. And this JSON dumps uh, method is just one that translates a Python dictionary into a JSON object that can be written to file, so it's a string. Um, and you can create more complex file names based on whatever needs you have. Uh, another cool feature of PyBids is this, there's a bids report and bids report is, is something that takes a layout and it generates a collection of reports describing, describing your data. And so the, you can, it has a feature called most common. This is, sorry about the, the double zeros and stuff. Uh, it's just the most common returns a list of tuples. So you take the first entry in the list and then the first, uh, first element in the tuple is this string uh, that says for session none, MR data were required, et cetera. Uh, so this can be helpful for gener automatically generating method sections uh, or at least parts of your method section. Um, so, I think we should probably take a break in just a minute, but I do want to kind of wrap up how we think about, or how I think about pie bids. Um, and this is, this for anybody who's done any neuroimaging before, you've probably been in one of three situations. One, you could be in your lab and 
you have to come up with how your lab organizes your data. And so you end up finding some kind of file structure that mirrors whatever tool suite you decide you're going to start trying to use. Uh, you build your file structures that, so that it matches that, so that things are just consistent between your, the different places you need to look, whether it's your metadata, your, uh, your original files, or your output files. You're also going to have a metadata folder where you encode any kind of scan parameters that you need to look up in the future or use in your analysis, as well as any kind of idiosyncrasies of an individual subject. Um, and then you're probably also going to have written a library of functions for fetching the files, the metadata, for computing the data, and finding where, where you're going to save the results. Uh, and then you'll have written likely things that say, okay, I need this result. Does the file exist? If so, just load it. If not, here's how you find the inputs to that and how to compute it. And so you end up building all of this uh, structure. And this ends up being, everybody does it and it, every lab has a different way of doing it. And this ends up having problems where if I want to go to another lab and say, you've collected similar data to mine, I want to see if my result re uh, replicates in your data. And they're like, oh yeah, well, here's how we organize our data. And now if they didn't happen to do it exactly the same way I did, I either have to update my code to learn how to interpret their data or I have to reformat their data to fit the expectations of my code. And now if the, if the result doesn't replicate, the question is, is it because the result isn't real or is it because of something that went wrong in the, this uh, impedance mismatch problem? Uh, so bids and the, basically by standardizing on a data structure, uh, we can write code to that structure and we can write it once. We can all agree that whether it's good code or bad code. And now, now when I go and ask you for your data, you, if you're able to give me a bids data set, I can run my, my code that I wrote for my bids data set directly on it. And I have a much higher confidence that failure to reproduce is related to effects or artifact, not if, actual, it's related to the contents of the data, not uh, the code or the organization. And just along with this, for people who do work in MATLAB, there is another project similarly, uh, it's called Bids MATLAB. Uh, there may be other ones in other languages that I just don't know about. Um, but I think at this point, it's probably a good idea to take a bit of a break. Um, and so if people have, uh, maybe people want to post questions and I'll have a look and we can cover those before we come back. JB, how long do you think we should take? I think we should take at least, uh, let's say, 10 minutes. Uh, let's say, let's take 10 minute break. Uh, that will also allow people to like a, uh, go back to your slides and uh, play a bit with uh, the data that the data set that they have uh, downloaded. Like so, so if you, uh, but also like a, also if you prefer and I think you should, you know, just like walk a bit around and uh, stretch yourself. And uh, uh, it's it's your, your last remarks are really important uh, as uh, you know was exemplified a couple of times already in this course. Uh, having bugs in the program of how you read data and all those things are, you know, are not uncommon, especially if those programs have been made by you know, someone who's done the best, but you know, as a, you know, there's a little mistake uh, somewhere. And, and if, there, if there isn't a community of people looking and trying and testing and checking, then it is way more likely that you will find a little bug somewhere that uh, may have some uh, maybe no impact or maybe big impact and uh, we don't know it really depends uh, so having those community tools uh, where there's a community looking at uh, the code and then checking uh, is uh, absolutely critical for uh, make you know like uh, having a, a more solid uh, basis for uh, the way we do science um, thank you so much chris for the for the first uh, some part of this talk we're looking forward to the next uh, uh, and next part and the and meanwhile we can take a bit caution but i will uh, urge you to take some uh, some uh, some uh, bit of a uh, break and uh, get back in 10 minutes so a little bit before 11:30 uh, okay And yes, if you can, uh, you know, like uh, 
in the course of this uh, day, like uh, play a little bit with my beats. Uh, just make sure that you you see uh, what it's doing and its power. It's a uh, it's it's a, such a useful, uh, incredibly useful tool. And again, why it's specific to neuroimaging, uh, the idea of having uh, a common standards for describing the data and a common library to access, read, uh, uh, possibly uh, uh, change, or all those things, uh, those, those data is, uh, is, is the powerful idea that we should uh, all keep in mind. Might as well just get moving on. Okay, so, We've seen that the uh, bids structure allows us to do some programmatic querying with uh, PyBids, and I've been mostly showing it to you in the context of, uh, of a Python prompt where you're able to just explore things as uh, interactively. But another thing that this allows is for this, for you to write programs that are similarly able to adapt to uh, the data. Um, and so this, yeah, uh, this specification allows these queries. And uh, so a few years ago, uh, I wasn't actually involved in this group, but uh, people came up with this idea of a bids app. And because so much information is just encoded directly in the data set that's coming in, you can make your uh, your command line protocol extremely simple. You just have the name of the app, the input directory, which is a bids directory, an output directory, and then what we call an analysis level. So the analysis levels are run, session, participant, and group. Uh, you'll know this is a little different. Notice this is a little different from with uh, the bids data sets or pi bids, where we our uh, levels were run, session, subject, and data set. So this again, this is one of those cases where the nomenclature varies a little bit between sort of the theory and the pi bids practice. Um, and again, this is just because there's some inconsistencies and pi bids tried to choose a, a, an internally consistent approach. So some examples of bids apps, uh, one is MRIQC, uh, which is a quality control tool for MRI and you run it it, exactly as I said. So there's MRIQC. There's a location of a bids app or a bids data set. Maybe I put my outputs in a processed directory and I name them the data set name and the, the pipeline name. And that's just what I do. And I want to run this on the group level. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, so that's one example of a bids app. FMRI prep is a uh, FMRI pre processing pipeline. And again, fMRI prep, input data set, output location. We'll run this at the participant level, and we might have a, uh, an extra option. Say, I want to only run it on one participant at a time. Again, it's the, these are completely different applications. They do very different things. But because the data set includes so much, uh, so much information, we're able to call them in essentially the same way. This means, this means a lot of different application types are possible. Uh, so if you go to, uh, if you're actually in these slides, you can click on this. This goes to bidsapps.neuroimaging.io and you'll see this list of apps. And so some of the applications that are available, you have these quality control, such as MRIQC and one called QAP, which I think is Quality Assurance Protocol. There are anatomical pipelines, such as FreeSurfer, Mindboggle, and Broccoli. Functional pipelines include fMRI prep, Brainiac, Hyperalignment, CPAC, SPM, and their diffusion pipelines, including, also including Nutmeg and uh, MRTrix. And these are all doing very different things. Well, sometimes very different. And uh, they're all able to do take exactly this protocol because you just give them a data set and it looks to see what data you, it needs that you've provided. And so this allows us to have a sort of virtuous cycle of uh, for researchers and tool developers. Um, when these apps exist, now there's an incentive for me to put my uh, data into bids beyond simply just, I think it's a good idea, because as soon as I do it, I now have a bunch of apps that I can try out on my data with extremely little effort. And so instead of being stuck in the first app that I managed to get my data through, 
I can actually compare. I can say, oh, I like Free Surfer versus AFNI uh, for this reason. Um, and similarly, if I'm writing a tool, uh, if I allow that tool to accept bids data sets, I instantly have a potential audience of people. All, I don't have to convince them that it's worth putting the effort in to get, uh, to get their data in a way that my tool can understand it is already there. So all I have to do is convince them that my tool is doing something interesting. Um, and so as the number of bids ups increases, the incentive to create bids data sets increases. And as the number of bids data sets increases, the incentive to create bid apps increases. Uh, so just to make this concrete, I'm going to show you a program, a bids app that you can write in a single slide uh, using just the things that we've learned already in this talk uh, earlier with PyBids. Um, if, you're, if you have the slides open, you can download this program. It's uh, part of, it's just in the uh, collection of things with the, uh, with the slideshow. Uh, but you can also just copy and paste it, it's fine. Um, so the first thing we need is we need uh, a couple system libraries. Uh, so from the standard library, we need sys and path. And then we need bids layout and bids report. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to, I'm going to create a report that gives me some notion of how much variation there was in the scan parameters uh, in my whole data set. So this line here, the command bids root out root, analysis level ops equals sysargv is, is the bids app protocol. Um, so sysargv is the arguments that are passed to the command line. The first one is always the command, then the inputs in order are the input uh, directory, the output directory, the analysis level, and then any optional outputs. We could do things in a nicer way, a more forgiving way for users, but users already know this is how this is how I order things. I don't have to be extremely forgiving uh, because th this is straightforward. Um, so that's really all, all you need to do in order to prepare yourself to have a bids app. And then naturally I'm going to create a bids layout from that points to the bids root directory. And so, just maybe just a quick uh, interjection, the uh, star ops, uh, can you just explain oh, yep. uh, what the star ops means here? Right, so sysargv is a list and it can be any length at all. And so if I want to assign each value in the list to another variable, if it were exactly four long, I could ignore this ops. But maybe somebody took the bids apps uh, protocol seriously and decided I'm going to add some options. Anything, anything that after the fourth argument will just be put into a list called ops. I'm gonna completely ignore it um, and so this is a kind of standard uh, Python uh, idiom for, uh, for assigning variables to the contents of a list. Or maybe the other way around, but either way. Okay, so and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a reports dictionary. And for each subject, and again, layout.get subjects, I'm going to create a report. So bids report layout. And then I generate it, and I'm going to only, I'm going to specify which subject I'm generating it for. So rather than generating it for all of the subjects at once, like I showed previously, I'm going to I can limit it just like I can a lot of queries. So I'll say just for this subject, report it, and this returns a dictionary. So where the keys are the reports. So I just use list to convert the dictionary to a list of keys and take the first one because it's going to only be one long. So the report is now a string. Now this this bit here is a little bit tricky. So reports dot set default. Set default is a Python dictionary thing that so if this report exists as a key in the reports dictionary, it will return whatever that is. If it's not, it will set that value to an empty list and return that empty list. So this uh, so this expression will always return a list. It may be empty. And then I'm going to add the current subject to that list. So as I loop through this, I'm building up a list or a dictionary where each uh, the keys are the reports, 
and the sub or the values are a list of subjects that produced the exact same report. And then to, to have a useful output, I'm going to create a path with uh, my output root. And this is just a useful Python approach. So path is an object that if you use slash, it then creates a, it, it creates a new file name with this and the, with report.txt following output root or out root. Um, I'm, I'm not sure it's very important to go into a great deal of detail, but hopefully that's clear. Um, so it will open that writable as an out file and out file has a write method. And, and here we're just going to say that I've detected this many uh, parameter sets and the length of the reports uh, dictionary will give me that number. So then for every report and list of subjects that had that report, we'll write a quick summary. So here, I probably made this a little more complicated than I needed to, but the last two lines are always the same. Uh, so just to avoid being overly repetitive, I dropped those. Uh, so split lines drops a, or splits a string and into a, becomes a list of strings for each line. And so I drop the last two and then rejoin them uh, with new lines. And then uh, I use a, these dashes as a break parameters for subjects. And then I, this creates the list of subjects as a comma separated list. So com comma space joining the subs or the subjects. Um, and we'll, you'll see what that looks like on the next slide. Uh, finally, we replace the, there's this uh, brackets deg um, thing, <laughs> phrase, I guess, uh, in, in the reports, and I'm just going to replace it with an actual degree symbol, just so it's a little bit more readable. And that's it. This is this is the entire program, and this will run uh, if you download it and run it on your the data set that Elizabeth uh, provided. You will get a, a result that looks similar to what I'm about to show you. And so the way we run it is it's, it's a bids app. So Python example bids app.py. So this is considered the command then input, output, and then analysis level. And then you can also download the outputs, and, but I've quoted some of it here. So we found nine scan parameter sets across this 155 uh, subject data set. The first one had these, these subjects. Not really important which ones, but that's what, just to show there are a, a number of them. And then it describes these were collected on this scanner. The T1 weighted images had these parameters. The, uh, the fMRI data had these parameters. You'll notice it says zero runs. This is a bug in PyBids that'll actually be fixed, or I think actually was fixed last night. And so wh what can you use this for? First, you can just use this to get a sense of a data set that you're looking at. Um, and to, maybe the scan parameters actually differ for good reasons across subjects. In this case, we have a large number of uh, child subjects that have different parameters. And then other cases, they're just, uh, so there's child or children and adults. Uh, the adults tend to have one set of parameters, children tend to have another set of parameters, but there aren't actually nine groups. So sometimes, so you might be one, you might go and look at why are there quite so many, do I need to exclude some of the subjects from being a little bit off? Should I just uh, keep a note to make sure that the subjects look reasonable when used in group uh, analyses? What various, uh, you can choose how to treat these results. And then of course, in, an, in a more complicated application, you might look at what these parameters are, probably not through the reports, uh, but you might modulate what kind of processing you do based on that. Okay. Um, okay, I think there might be a question worth, let's see. F for writing to the bottom. Yeah. Okay, so the hierarchy of analysis levels. 
So that's actually, a, I'll get to a little bit in the slide after the current one. So I might hold that one off for just a second uh, and then I'll try to be a little bit more explicit. <coughs> okay, so in addition to this protocol, BidZeps um, was, it tries to address some, or some questions of reproducibility and uh, stability of analysis uh, that don't, you get a little bit of that for free from the, from just having the same code running each time. But there's also, uh, there are some engineering practices that you can engage in to help improve uh, the stability. So suppose we have a, so this is the schema they proposed. Um, so they show these various bid zaps and the point here is that you might, your bid zap might be written as a shell script, as a Python, uh, as a Python program, as an R script. And it doesn't really matter. Any, you can write a bids app in any language. The key here is this idea of a Docker file. And I think you guys have already gone a little bit over Docker, but uh, the gist of it is that it allows you to create a more consistent environment for your app to run in so that a lot or some sources of variation that make it hard to, um, hard to be sure that an app is gonna do the right thing every time can be sort of smoothed over. And it also makes it easier to run a continuous integration server, which is a, uh, sorry. Um, which is just a way of making sure you, you can write tests. And uh, so every time you update your application, a computer goes and runs it on some example data and makes sure that it doesn't crash, that it provides the right outputs. Anything that you want to ensure, any guarantees you want to make about your app, uh, you can put into these tests that can be run every single time. And then the you can once that's done and you're sure that your data set is or your app is in good shape, you can push it to Docker Hub, which is just a way of distributing a, an application as a container that comes with all of the dependencies that it needs. And the nice thing about uh, these Docker images is that you can run them on Linux, uh, on Mac, on Windows, and it's gonna be as close as possible to running them on, on identical environments. There are gonna be some differences because you can't, you can't control for absolutely everything, but it's, it's a huge step forward in terms of uh, making sure that the code that you run uh, is, is basically the same. Um, and so it's a, it's a way of reducing variability. And there's also uh, Docker images can be converted to singularity, which is more uh, popular on high performance computing centers. Um, and so again, when you're running a, on your cluster, you can be running as close as possible to the exact same code as, uh, as you are when you test it on your local system or when the app developer developed it and tested it on the continuous integration server. Um, and this uniform interface also eases uh, deployment on uh, yeah, HPC. Um, so not just your own clusters, but there's also Seabrain, which uh, is a Canadian cluster that uh, allows external users and by giving them a, a basic protocol, this is what a bids app looks like. They can give you a drop down list of here are the apps that we support, here are the data sets that you can access, and here's where you put the outputs. And right there, you've already just described a bids app protocol. And so that, or AWS batch, it makes it easy to, it, it really lowers the friction of making these apps available uh, in various places. Okay, so here's the slide where we talk about analysis levels. Um, and what they do, so, so we'll just look at this one for example. Say you, uh, you have one run of data per subject. You might want to fit, uh, you might want to fit your uh, model to one subject's worth of data. And, that's completely independent for each subject. And so by putting this participant uh, label on it, you're telling it, it doesn't need to know anything about any other participants. These are all 
separate uh, processes. Um, and they can be distributed on, for instance, a high performance computing center um, to run independently, finish when they will. And then, then when you come back and have those all done, you can run the group level workflow that takes the input or the outputs of the first level workflow and combines them in some, in some useful way. So whether it's a group statistic or whether it's just putting together a nice report uh, that, um, that summarizes all of, all of the individual runs. Um, and so similarly, if, if you have something that you might want to run on each run uh, within a subject before you combine it at the subject level, you could insert a run level, you could insert a session level. Um, it's, it's just a way of uh, sort of scoping what the task of each app is at, within a given invocation. So some apps only implement one or of these levels, others might implement all of them. So hopefully that was clear. All right, so I think, I think you were introduced to this matrix already, which I think is a very useful way of thinking about um, issues of reproducibility, because it's a somewhat fraught term. Um, and, and as I've sort of indicated already, I think start to finish pipelines help in performing reproducible analyses because there's fewer places for humans to intervene and cause unintentional variations. <clears throat> so um, just to recap what these matrices are. Um, so reproducible means if you run the same data analysis on the same data and get the same result, that is a reproducible result. If you run the same analysis on different data, that's a replicated result. Uh, the method can be robust if it uses, or no, the result can be robust if uh, two different analyses manage to find the same effect in the same data. And the effect might be generalizable if you have multiple analyses, multiple data, and you keep finding this effect. So bids allows you to make your data more easily shared and, uh, and bids apps are a good way of sharing your code. So if you have an open analysis on your open data, that's subject to reproduction and not just by yourself and being able to run it again and again and get the same result, but somebody else can go out and verify that what you said you did in your paper, you actually, they can see it. But if you accept bids data sets, then it actually makes replicating results on independent data easier. And I sort of discussed this earlier as well. Um, it's now the case that if, if I find another data set that's ostensibly trying to evoke the same uh, cognitive task or cognitive effect that I'm looking at, and I believe my analysis will find it, I can go find a different data set and actually directly test that and it becomes much easier. Um, and similarly, having this common interface allows us to move in this uh, a little bit more freely in this um, analysis dimension where it's, it's easier for me to find two pipelines that are ostensibly doing the same thing and see whether I'm able to find that result in both pipelines. Uh, for instance, AFNI and Resurfer both, uh, both get, can find um, metric or mor uh, morphometry data from on uh, the cortical surface. So if, if I think I found a useful effect that is in Resurfer and I can, and somebody else wrote a bids app interface to AFNI um, to, to look for the exact same um, <clears throat> the exact same effect. I can just throw my data at it and see if this actually occurs. And then if it doesn't, then I can start asking why much more easily than it used to be. I used to have to ma mangle my data in a different way in order to ask that. And then I have to decide, okay, was the reformatting of the data the actual problem? Um, yeah, so the, again, this uh, reusable code is part of what we get, but there's, uh, as I kind of mentioned with the Docker stuff earlier, um, 
there are ways that the same code might not produce the same results. So there are a couple, uh, there are several good papers on this, uh, but I've only linked to two. Um, one, use different versions of FreeSurfer on different versions of Mac OS and manage to find significant uh, group level differences between where the groups were defined by which uh, system you ran it on, which is problematic. Um, and similarly, this other one, uh, I think also they modified operating systems, but also they used different tools such as different versions of FSL or different versions of Daphne or something like that. And, uh, and we're also able to find that you get significantly different results because that are based not on the input data, but entirely on the software that you ran. And finally, you might have data that, or you might have algorithms that are stochastic uh, or have some sort of intentional source of randomness, intentional or unintentional for that matter. Um, so a lot of the algorithms are seeded uh, with a random number, uh, usually as a way of preventing, uh, preventing artificially uh, stable results. But that can also be a source of variation and you have a bunch of small errors that, uh, that aggregate over a pipeline and now it's hard to track down where, where these sources of variation uh, came from. So container technologies uh, partially address the environmental sources. Um, you have to be uh, addressing stochastic uh, components is, is its own problem because some, some tools let you set seeds, some tools don't, and you're, that, that's fun. Um, and then there are some other tools that are kind of, that are useful. So one that I would point you to is called NeuroDocker. And that, the goal of that is to have a easy way to generate a Docker container that has all the dependencies you need um, and will produce as much as possible identical containers every time you run it. Um, and there are also some tools uh, that I'm not really sure if there are any available right now, but there, uh, there's progress being made in helping quantify uh, more systematically these differences. So they would help you do things like run these uh, 2012 and 2015 papers pretty much as a, as a script where you say, here's my analysis, vary over these uh, parameters on this, uh, this tool. And then you can just point it at any different, any kind of tool and see which, of, when I vary, say operating system, how, how stable are my results relative to that? Uh, and a useful concept there is called vibration ratio, um, which I believe is defined as the variation, uh, the variance in effect estimates over the size of the effect estimate um, when you don't change anything meaningful in the data. Okay, I should probably stop for a quick question. Anything? Looks like you've answered something, Elizabeth. Is there anything I should still go over? Yes, please, uh, Chris, uh, continue because I think uh, time is uh, getting short. Oh, you're right. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, I might need to skip over the Fitland's uh, Neuroscout thing then. Okay. So very quickly. Um, yeah. So the output of a bids app is a derivative data set. Uh, and this is an extension to the bids standard. Uh, and the goal really is to try to uh, make the derivatives of, uh, of bids apps also usable in further pipelines. So I'm going to kind of just fly through this. Uh, there's some increased metadata that allows you to, to talk about better how, how your data was produced, um, but most of the principles are intended to be the same. But for instance, now formats like Gifty need to be allowed um, because it's a common derivative. Okay, so sorts of derivatives people want, usually images that uh, need to be analyzed further, statistics of interest for publication or figures or reports for either publication or uh, assessing the quality of the data or the processing that was done. Okay, so I don't think we're gonna have time for a second break. <clears throat> so very quickly, BitLens is a project I've uh, spent a bit of time on. Um, 
So this is a tool for estimating GLMs uh, at, as a bids app. And so it, nas or it naturally takes a bids data set. This is the bids logo, by the way. Um, so I'm using that as a stand-in for a data set. Uh, and what we need from that is task events, physiological time series, et cetera. Uh, we also need bids derivatives, which might be produced by uh, fMRI prep um, or any other similar tool. And there we need pre-process bold series, time series for compounds, et cetera. And then as I was kind of mentioning earlier, PyBids can take, uh, PyBids can take a bids data set, a bids derivatives data set, and a JSON model and help you generate uh, design matrices for calculating GLMs. And finally, we use NyLearn to take the derivatives and the models and calculate statistics. <coughs> um, yep, yeah, I'm not going to go through this. I was just trying to show that it's the basic concept of Pitlands is very simple, but uh, you can read through this on here and if you have uh, the time and inclination. Um, so Fitlands, uh, there, there's a really cool tool that's built on Fitlands called Neuroscout and that's a web-based platform for fast and flexible analysis of fMRI data. And what does that mean? It means they've found a bunch of open data sets that are uh, naturalistic, which means they put people in the scanner and had them listen to audiobooks or watch movies or something similar. And so there isn't really a task except for watch a movie, and we're just gonna try to see what your brain does and we'll analyze it later. Uh, and crucially, all of these uh, data sets are available in bids format, accessible via data lab. And Alejandro and Tal, who worked on this project, uh, pre-processed all of that data with fMRI prep. So that's all accessible. Okay, and so now how do you analyze uh, this unstructured or semi-structured data? Because uh, there aren't any events. So what you need to do is you need to uh, annotate the stimuli, um, which are movies or, uh, or audio tracks. So this is, um, yeah, uh, so you, you need this in order to find any kind of feature of interest or compounds. So they have a library that allows you to extract a lot of uh, features, such as whether there are faces um, in the screen scene, what, where those faces are in the visual scene, other low-level statistics, brightness, loudness, um, colors, uh, parts of speech, fun things like that. OK, so if we have about two minutes, I can show this, these videos. Otherwise, I can just point people to the website. How do you feel, Jamie? I think I think we should take the two minutes. I mean, having like a five-ish minutes late, that's that's entirely fine. It's a, it's 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 okay. nice to have all these things. So the, I'll try to narrate these as quickly as Alejandro did. I stole these uh, videos from his presentation last year. Um, so he's creating an analysis uh, using automated face detection, and he's trying to predict that you'll see fusiform face area activation. He's going to use the Raiders of the Lost Ark data set, and uh, he's going to he's going to select all of the subjects from it. So then, once it finds the predictors, he's going to find a face-related predictor, the face detection confidence, and then he's going to try to find some confounds. Maybe he thinks head motion is the most likely thing to confound with it. So he'll find uh, the rotation uh, parameters and the translation parameters. And that's going to be his set of uh, predictors for his um, for his GLM. So he's going to rescale. So there are a lot of different transformations you can do. He's going to rescale uh, the face detection confidence in between zero and one, right? uh, and then he's going to make sure that's convolved with an HRF. And then he's going to generate contrasts. By default, it just gives you a t-test for the um, HRF convolved variables, and that's it. Um, then the next slide is when you get to review your results. So it shows you an example um, example design matrix. It shows you the time courses. You can select just a one. So this is your zero to one um, HRF convolved uh, face confidence. And you also want to look for if you have any excessively correlated variables. Then uh, once you finalize and run, it's going to generate a 
uh, command for you. That, and so it just prints out a Docker command that you run or you copy to your uh, to your terminal, and that's going to uh, download a the data that you selected. It's going to download the uh, model that was generated by Neuroscout, and along with the um, along with the regressors that you selected. And it's going to use Fitlands to run it, find the stats, and it will automatically upload them to NeuroVault, which if we haven't gone into, I'm, I'm not going to try to right now. Um, and so as an example, if you want to look for this fa these face uh, things, you do find some, you find some blobs that are plausibly fusiform face area. And you found that with very little effort. Um, and similarly, you can look for speech tasks, you can see some nice uh, superior temporal results. So what is NeuroScout? Um, I would say that NeuroScout is a tool that allows you to rapidly generate hypotheses. You come up with a cognitive task, a plausible, uh, a, a plausible correlate for that task and possible confounds. And then you go to this website where you have hours and hours of data that were collected by somebody else at great expense and they're completely independent and so when you get a when you're able to look at a number of these data sets and see oh yes this is how if i look for this particular effect this is how how strong the effect is this is how big the effect is this is how consistent it is across independently collected data that allows you to make sensible predictions about how much data you might need to collect in order to find the effect you're looking for uh, in a more focused study and this is possible because uh, researchers are willing to share large amounts of expensive data freely. And crucially, they share them as bids data sets that you can process with bids apps like fMRI prep and produce bids derivatives that can be further analyzed with apps like uh, Fitland. <clears throat> so just to fully wrap up, uh, the takeaways from all of this, bids is a standard for organizing neuroimaging data and metadata. PyBids provides programmatic access to files and metadata. Bids apps use a common protocol to process data sets, improving interoperability and facilitating reproducibility. Derivatives are process data sets that can be queried like bids data sets, enabling higher order applications. And the apps incentivize using bids and data sets and incentivize writing apps. Uh, so you get this virtuous cycle and you really build an ecosystem that makes it worthwhile to produce really neat tools like NeuroScout can take advantage of these open data sets and derivatives. Uh, the point of this slide is mostly to demonstrate how ridiculously many people have contributed to all of these related tools. Uh, there are over 120 named contributors in the BIDS community, and a lot of these tools have uh, not necessarily that many, but comparably many uh, contributors. So this is a major effort, and um, I think ecosystem is probably the best word for it. Uh, I also have some resources. I'll probably add to this later. Um, but if you're if you go to these slides you'll be able to find those links and with that i will finish up and take any questions